Remember when games came with luxurious printed manuals? Of course not, because that was prehistory, and now it's all about the video tutorial. Now, I made one of those a while back, but since then the game has changed and I might have learnt a little bit more about video production. Don't count on that. But let's have another try. Here's how to get started with OpenTTD 12.1. I've divided this tutorial into six sections. Getting the game, how to make money, road vehicles, trains, boats and aircraft. You can skip to each section through the magic of chapter headings. The easiest way to get the game is through Steam, GOG or the Microsoft Store. Search for OpenTTD. These versions will be packaged with all the graphics and sound files you need to get started. OpenTTD is always free to download and free to play. If anyone asks you to pay money for it, that's a scam. But if you would like to donate toward the cost of running the game servers, you can do so through the official website. I'll put a link in the description. This main menu might seem a bit complicated at first, with lots of options. But there are only two things you need to know about to get started. This middle section lets you select between four climates, temperate, Subarctic, Subtropical and Toyland. Each has different vehicles and different industries, making for different levels of challenge. Temperate is the easiest to get started with, so make sure that river is highlighted. Then you can choose New Game. There are many settings here to customise your game, including our old friend the Climate selection, but the defaults are good for getting started. You can always come back and experiment, once you've played a couple of games, to find out what works for you. To build a game world and get started, click the green Generate button. Once you're in game, the camera controls are simple. Hold the right mouse button and drag to move the view. Use the scroll wheel to zoom in or out. You can left click the map icon on the top bar to open a map, and click on the map to move the view to that location. As well as clicking on buttons like the map, you can also hold down the left mouse button to reveal more options. That's most useful on this disk menu, where you can abandon the current game, quit your operating system or save your current progress. Some other useful icons are this boss, which will open the company screen. You can view your company here, give both yourself and the company a name and choose a colour for your vehicles. And this money icon will show your company finances. Right now, we're paying interest on a loan and some maintenance costs. What we need is to make some money. How do you make money in OpenTTD? By transporting things. Who would have expected that from a game inspired by something called Transport Tycoon? Almost everything in the OpenTTD world has a cargo it produces a cargo it accepts, or both. To find out what a building accepts and produces, you can click on it with the left mouse button if it's a large industry building, or use this land area information tool if it's a small one. Town buildings like these flats usually both produce and accept passengers and mail. That 7 eighths and 2 eighths mean you'll need more than one building of this type near your station for the cargo to be accepted. There has to be at least eight eighths worth of acceptance in total. Sometimes larger town buildings will also accept goods produced by industries. When you're done with a tool like the land area information, you can press escape to cancel it. Speaking of industries, these large industry buildings will produce or accept special industry cargoes. There are three types. Primary industries, like this coal mine, will produce cargo by themselves. The amount changes randomly, but it's more likely to go up if you provide a good transport service, and more likely to go down if you provide a bad one. Some primary industries, like these oil wells, will always decrease in production until they shut down. Sinks, like this power station, accept a cargo and consume it themselves. Think of it as a bottomless pit into which you can tip coal and keep getting paid for it. 
producers accept one or more cargoes from another industry and turn it into something else. Like this steel mill, which converts iron ore into steel. Note that it currently isn't producing anything. You'll only get steel once you deliver iron ore, and then you can take the steel to a factory, like this one, for it to be turned into goods. Completing these chains of cargo is what makes OpenTCD so addictive. If you want to find out what goes where, you can click this menu option to show the cargo chains. It's a little bit fiddly until you get used to it, but you can choose industries or cargoes and see what's produced where and who you need to deliver it to. Finally, different cargo pays different rates for delivery. You can open the cargo payment rates to find out. The payment goes down the longer you take to make a delivery. The further you transport a cargo, the more you'll get paid. Some cargo, like goods, pays well for click quick delivery, but badly for slow delivery. Other cargo, like oil, doesn't pay as well, but it doesn't matter if you take a long time to deliver it. As the game progresses, you'll get faster vehicles which let you take advantage of those cargoes which require express delivery. Starting the game, transporting coal is an excellent choice. It pays well and doesn't mind being put on a slow vehicle. The only drawback is it goes to a sink industry, so you can't make anything out of it. But how do we build a transport network? I'm going to start with road vehicles. They're simple and cheap to build, so even if you make a mistake and your first route isn't profitable, you can build a few more without running out of money. Every type of vehicle route in OpenTCD has the same requirements. A depot, in which to build new vehicles and service existing ones. Stations for the vehicles to load and unload at. And orders, telling the vehicles to go to the stations. Land vehicles will also need some infrastructure to connect all these things together. All those depots, stations and roads are kept here, under the roads icon. I can see a coal mine here, which produces a useful amount of coal. 128 is good production for an industry. If you see 160 or more, that's excellent for the start of the game, but if you see only 40, then it's best to look for something else to connect until you're already making plenty of money. I'm going to use the map to find a nearby power station. By cl clicking this industry icon, I can see all of the industries on the map. We have a power station close by. It's almost as if I deliberately set this scenario up to record tutorials in it. First, I'm going to build my stations. Road vehicle stations are divided into blue bus stations for passengers and brown lorry stations for everything else. Because we're transporting coal, we need a lorry terminal. I'm going to select this one with the built-in parking spaces, making sure the entrance faces in a useful direction for heading to the power station. Then I'm going to place one next to my coal mine here. You can see as I do this that the station window shows what is produced and accepted near the station. If I click Coverage Area Highlight On, I'll get some blue tiles shown around the station. Those blue tiles show something called the catchment area. Anything in the blue zone can use this station. Different stations have larger or smaller catchment areas. Next, I need to go to the power plant and place another station there so my lorries will be able to unload coal into the bottomless pit. Now I need to connect them with roads. If you click on either of these two straight road tiles, the cursor will change to this road placing mode. You can click to place half a tile of road, or you can drag to place mini tiles at once. If you make a mistake, you can use either this bomb tile to blow up everything on a tile, or this remove tool by clicking on the straight line and then clicking on the bulldozer to surgically remove a half tile at once. This latter is useful when you want to remove only one part of a junction. Once you get comfortable with the two straight road tiles, you can also use this crossroad tool. This is the auto road tool. Unlike the straight road tools, you can drag it in any direction and it will place roads in that direction 
It's a little trickier to use, but much quicker when you're building a complex network. You'll see as I do this that red numbers are floating up from my roads. This is how much each section costs me to build. If you want to know how much something will cost, hold down as the shift key as you build it. This will show a window with the estimated cost rather than building it. Sometimes you might want to modify the landscape. Vehicles travel faster on flat straight roads than they do climbing hills and going round corners, so flattening small bumps can make your networks much more efficient. To do that, I open the landscaping toolbar by clicking on this landscape. This up arrow raises the land and this down arrow lowers it. You can drag them to raise and lower large areas. And if you hold down the control key, you'll get a diagonal area in case that's more useful. Sometimes you want to flatten land to a particular height, which is what this tool with the equal sign is for. Now, I have three obstacles in my way, these two rivers and this hill. I could use the landscaping tools to level them, but filling in the water will cost a lot of money. If I hold down the shift key and use this raised land tool, look, it will cost too much money for my early game bank balance. Flattening the hill is cheaper, but it would still cost me a lot of money. Instead, you can build bridges and tunnels using these controls. To build a bridge, drag it across the gap you want to fill. You can build flat bridges between two opposing banks like this, bridges on flat land with ramps to go over an obstacle, or a combination of the two. Tunnels are built slightly differently. You need to place the entrance on a straight slope. Sometimes you won't have the right type of slope, so you can use the landscaping tools to edit the terrain. Here I have a good entrance, so I can build my tunnel. It will automatically bore its way in a straight line to an exit on the other side. But be careful with tunnels. Long ones can be very expensive. Use the shift key before building them. I just go to finish connecting both my stations. And now that they're connected, I need a depot to build the lorries in. If you place it close to the loading station, it will save some time. So I'm going to put it here. On large networks, you will need multiple depots so vehicles don't take a long time finding their nearest one. With the default settings, if vehicles can't get easily to a depot for servicing, they will break down much more frequently, blocking your roads and tracks. If I left click on the depot, I will get a window letting me build and manage vehicles. On the right hand side are buttons for selling vehicles, either one at a time or everything in the depot. But right now, I want to build, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to transport coal, so we need a coal lorry. Once I've built it, I get a window for that vehicle. Now I can click this arrow to give it the orders telling which stations it should go to. Click on the coal mine station, and then the power station. But I'm not done yet. I don't want this to just pick up whatever coal is available. I want it to wait in the station until it's full. So I select the order to highlight it and click this full load button. You'll note there's also an unload option, but I don't need to select that as the vehicle will unload automatically if the station accepts the cargo. If I look at the information for this vehicle here, you'll see it carries 20 tonnes of coal. But the coal mine is producing 128 tonnes per month, so I'm going to need more than one vehicle. I could go through all the steps I just went through to build another and give it orders, but I'm too lazy for that. Luckily there's a shortcut. This button on the vehicle window and this button in the depot lets me clone a vehicle. A secret here is that if you hold the control key when you clone a vehicle, those vehicles will gain something called shared orders. This means if you change the orders of one vehicle, it will make the same change to all the other vehicles it shares orders with. This is very useful if you're changing your network. 
I'm going to build five coal lorries and set them going. As they reach the loading station, you'll see only two of them can stop and load at a time, with the rest having to queue. This won't be a problem, as they'll spread out over these tracts, but if I needed more capacity, I could build a second lorry terminal joined to the existing one, like this. I can only build road where road vehicles aren't already trying to travel, so I need to build a longer road here to connect it to my network. I have quite a few windows open now, so to clear up my screen, I could close them all individually, but to do that far quicker, I can press the delete key, which will remove everything. Building a passenger network is much the same. You can build a bus service in a single town, between two or more different towns, or any combination of the two. All you need to do is place your stops where there are enough houses to both accept and produce passengers. Sometimes you might want to demolish a house to get a station in just the right place, which the bomb tool is excellent for. Sometimes a town won't let you demolish something. This is because your local authority rating isn't high enough. To find out, click the town name and this button here to show your local authority rating. If the rating gets down to very poor or even appalling, you won't even be able to build stations near the town. Towns dislike it when you demolish trees and buildings or provide poor service, and they like it when you provide a frequent tra transport service or you plant trees like this. Those bus stops are at the edge of town, so I'm going to add one in the centre. Rather than demolishing more buildings to do that, I'm going to use one of these other types of bus stop. This is a drive-through road stop. The downside of one is that vehicles stop on the road and block it, but the benefit is you can place it on any straight road tile without a junction. If you use an add-on pack with articulated vehicles, you'll need to build drive-through road stops for them to be able to stop. Now I've built all my stations, I'm going to build a depot and set up my buses. This is similar to when I set up the lorries, but this time I don't want them to full load. I'm going to let them pick up however many passengers are waiting and then drive off. Sometimes you may find yourself wanting to see how a route performs, or if you've been very busy, you'll have spent all your money and need to wait for your network to make some more. To help speed things up, OpenTTD has a fast forward button on the left of the menu bar next to the pause. Of course, you don't want to fast forward the game unless you're making a profit. With a couple of routes, we want to know which of them is making money. Click on this bus icon to see the list of road vehicles. I can click on this drop down next to sort by to change what they're sorted by, including the profit that they're currently making. You can see my coal lorries make more than most of my buses. But longer distance passenger routes can be a good investment because once you have enough passengers to fill every vehicle, you make money in each direction rather than just one way. On the bottom left is the total profit across all my vehicles. To make this more useful, the vehicles can be organised into groups. Click this icon on the bottom left to create a group. We ask to type in a name and then you can click OK or press return. You can drag vehicles into the group one by one, but there's a shortcut too. If you hold down control, all vehicles with shared orders are added to the group at the same time. I'm going to do the same for my coal trucks. Now we can see how much profit each group of vehicles has made. Those coal lorries were a far better investment than the buses. To see if this profit from vehicles is enough to pay the loan interest and property maintenance, you can open the main finances window. The total shows whether each year has been a profit or loss. You can see that building all those roads in the first year was expensive, but now we're turning a small profit. To increase that profit, we need to build more routes and transport more cargo. It's possible to make such a large functioning network using nothing but road vehicles. 
but you'd be missing out on all the other vehicles OpenTCD has to offer. Let's move on to trains. Trains are the iconic vehicle of OpenTTT, thanks to the rich complexity of signals, junctions and station designs. They're also one of the hardest to get to grips with, thanks to the rich complexity of signals, junctions and station design. But if you're already familiar with building road vehicle routes, and making them profitable, they're not so difficult. A simple train route for one train only needs the same things as a road vehicle route. Two stations, a depot, and track to link them. But even this is a bit more complex. When I open the railway toolbar, you can see there are four different directions of track. And that's not all. When I build a station, I need to decide how many platforms it will have, and how long it should be. Train length is a deeply personal choice. Some players like having mini tiny trains, which accelerate quickly and provide frequent services, while others enjoy the spectacle of seeing huge American-style freight consists wind their way around mountains. But a good starting point is to have a train able to carry roughly a month and a half of industry production. This iron ore mine produces 128 tonnes of iron ore, so we need a train that can carry around 192 tonnes. To find out how long a train that will take, we could build one in a depot, but we can also check before building. If you open the trains window by clicking on the train icon, you'll see it showing all of our zero trains. But at the bottom of the window is this Available Trains button. This shows us all of the trains we can buy. Scrolling down to the iron ore hopper, we see it carries 30 tonnes of iron ore. So to carry a month and a half of cargo from our industry, we'll need six wagons for a capacity of 180 tonnes, which is a little less than 192, but close enough. Each wagon is half a tile long, and we'll need an engine too, so that gives us a train length of three and a half tiles. If a train tries to load or unload on a station platform that's shorter than the train, it'll be very slow, so we know our platforms need to be at least four tiles long. I'll build those now, one next to the iron ore mine and one next to the steel mill. You can choose the number of platforms and length from the buttons, but I like this drag and drop approach. I want to start with only a single train, so I'll build just a single platform. Next, I need to connect them with tracks. Just like roads, I can either build each individual direction, or I can use the automatic tool. When you're building rails, not only do you want to keep them as flat as you can, you want to make sure the turns are nice and gradual, so the trains don't slow down too much. Make sure you only turn 45 degrees at a time, and always have at least one piece of track before you change direction again. Ideally, two or more, so faster trains don't slow down. Finally, I need to build my depot. If I place it next to the track, you'll see it automatically creates a junction for the train to access the track. Now I can get to the important part, building my first train. Unlike the road vehicles, we've got a choice of engines. Early on in a game, you need to choose carefully between cost and speed. These Kirby pool tanks are slow, but you could build two trains and some extra wagons for the price of a single Ginzu A4. However, we get paid more for delivering cargo faster, and more powerful locomotives are better at hauling long trains and climbing hills. For now, I'm going to pick the Cheney Jubilee, it's a nice compromise, nearly as fast and powerful as the A4, but a lot cheaper to buy and to run. I'll build one locomotive, and six iron ore hoppers. You can see the length appear next to the train in the depot. If I click the information tab, and then the total cargo button, it will show me the capacity, 180 tonnes. I'll close that and set up the route the same as I did with the road vehicles using a full load at the iron ore mine. As a shortcut, rather than selecting the order and changing it, I can hold control when I click on the iron ore mine station and it will automatically become a full load order. If I start my train, you can see it head to the iron ore mine station and start to load iron ore. I could click fast forward to see what happens after it makes several trips. Or I could just skip ahead through the magic of video editing. 
I can open the train window, the same way I did with the road vehicles, to see what the profit is. You can see this train is very profitable, where it moves large quantities of cargo at high speed. If I click on the station, I can see how much cargo is waiting. You can see there's a lot here, more than a full train. And if I click Ratings, this shows me what the station rating is. If I now click the iron ore mine, you can see how much cargo it's producing recently and how much was actually transported to the station. Have you noticed those percentages are very similar? To increase the station rating, I need a more frequent service and less cargo waiting for a train to turn up. This will increase the amount of cargo the industry sends to my station, and if I keep my rating above 66%, then the iron ore mine will continue to increase the total amount it produces, giving me even more iron ore to transport around my network. I need a second train. I can build another by opening the depot, finding my existing train, and control clicking on it with the clone train tool to clone it and share the orders. But when I click start, what's this? My new train refuses to move. This is because, like a real railway, a railway in the game is divided into blocks. Each block can only have one train in it at a time. Currently, we don't have anything dividing up the railway, so it's all one big block. Because there's only one block, only one train can run on it. To divide it up, we need two things. Signals and places for the trains to pass each other. Places to pass are easy. Just build some track connected to the existing track, creating an extra lane. This needs to be at least as long as your longest train plus a tile or two for the signals. This short track only needs one or two passing places, but longer routes will need more. We've added some more track, but the train in the depot still isn't moving. That's because it's still all one block, just with multiple options for the one train that's allowed in it. To add another train, we need to divide it into blocks using signals. To build some, click on the signal icon. The default signals in OpenTTT are path signals, these allow more than one train to be in a single block if their paths are guaranteed not to conflict. While that sounds very complicated, all it means is that if trains are headed to different places, they can both enter the same block if they're taking different routes. These are like real-world signals. You only have to worry about the trains in the direction your points are set for. Signals are available in both semaphore and colour light versions, but each signal in a column works the same way. There are two types of path signal. This one on the right acts as a signal in one direction and a no entry sign in the other. Trains can never pass this in the opposite direction. The other on the left acts as a signal in one direction and can be ignored in the other. This is a bit complicated as what it means is that when a train passes it in the wrong direction, it reserves a path all the way to the next front facing signal and no other train can share those tracks. Most of the time, you'll only need to use one-way path signals. Let's build some. I'm going to take my passing place and put a signal on each direction. I only need to put signals where I want the trains to stop and wait. Everything else will be handled by the path reservation mechanic. Speaking of which, do you see those tracks turning dark? This is a feature in OpenTTD that shows me the path each train has reserved. You can see, as the train moves, it reserves a path up to the next front-facing signal. No other train can share this path. And if another train has any tiles reserved between here and the next signal, the train won't be able to reserve a path, and it will stop. This kind of layout with passing places is fine for running a couple of trains, but there's a lot of waiting around involved. I've rather lost the benefit of having those nice, fast, chainy jubilees. So for a busy route, we need more than just passing places, we need double track. It's easy to upgrade. All you need to do is convert the remaining single track sections to two parallel tracks. However, when we join the tracks which have signals on them, we need to be very careful. If you remove a signal protecting track which another train has reserved, it can cause a crash, so it's best to move the signals before joining the tracks. Build a new signal, then press R while you have the signal window open to change to removing signals. The highlight will turn red 
and you can click on a signal to remove it. I can then complete building my tracks and remove the connecting tracks as well. I'm then going to add a third train and set my railway in motion. Now that things have been in motion for a while, you'll notice I still have a lot of waiting around. That's partly because I need to upgrade my stations, but also because I haven't built any new signals. This train couldn't get any further because the train in front of it has some tiles reserved between here and the next signal. On double track, we want to build signals at regular intervals. Luckily, OpenTCD has just the tool. If I place a signal or take an existing one, then hold down control and drag a line away from it, OpenTCD will place signals at a regular distance all the way up to the next signal or junction. It does that at the distance shown here. Four is a good compromise between allowing plenty of trains to run and not having too many signals on quiet routes. You can see these trains can now get much closer while they're queuing. It's vitally important to place signals at consistent gaps, so trains don't have to stop because the gap gets longer and suddenly a train that wasn't in the way now is. So we need to remove some of our old passing place signals. Do this. We press R again, get the red highlight, and click the signals to remove. So we can then drag all the way up to the junction. Stations are still a bottleneck on this layout. To solve that, we need to upgrade them to double track. This is easy to do. You can either build a platform next to the existing one, or drag over the whole station. This gives you different appearances for the final station, which can be used for artistic effect. We need to connect these up, which is very simple. Build an X directly in front of the station, then connect it up to the existing tracks, removing any joining tracks which are no longer needed. You can also place signals right at the entrance and exit of the X to maximize throughput, Note that there's a shortcut key for, for placing signals, which is S. These signals allow trains to wait right at the entrance of the station and leave the moment their way is clear. Building stations that allow departing trains to be packed as closely as possible can get addictive. Experimenting to see what works is fun, but you can use this simple two-track station design with the X in front of it without worrying. It's efficient and can handle up to 1500 tonnes of cargo per month. You might be wondering why there are no signals between the X and the station, yet two trains can share this block. That's because the trains don't try to reserve a new path until they turn around. So as long as one platform is free, an incoming train is free to reserve its own path across the X and into the platform. You can use this same trick to put a depot directly on the X. Although beware that trains entering and exiting the station for servicing can block access to the station. Now we've added all this capacity, the station rating is much improved and more cargo is being transported from the iron ore mine. The real fun with trains comes when we start to build a network. I'm going to connect another iron ore mine. This one produces 56 tonnes per month, so I'm only going to need tiny trains with free wagons. Having trains of different lengths on your network can make things more complicated, but complexity is why we play this game, right? I'm going to build my small station as double track from the start. When my track reaches the existing railway, I need to connect it. I could use a simple flat junction, like this, but that will soon run into capacity problems where trains block each other crossing the line. For an efficient network, I need wide turns and grade separated tracks. So instead, I build a bridge over the tracks. While the trains slow down a little going over it, it's still much better than having them conflict with each other. I try to keep the signal distances as consistent as possible to keep my trains flowing well. Next, I build my small trains for the iron ore mine. To speed up giving them orders, 
I'm going to make sure I hold control when I go, when I click on the iron ore station. It's a full load order. Now I have multiple trains on my network, multiple routes. I need to be careful that each station has enough space for all of its trains to wait without blocking anything else. If the queue for one station spills out onto the main line, it will block all of the other trains and cause a disaster for our profits. Just like the road vehicles, we can organise our trains into groups to check how much profit each line makes. Our long iron ore trains are very profitable. But also, look how much steel that steel mill is producing with the iron ore from two different mines. Steel is a high paying cargo. So we should take that somewhere. Normally we'd build more trains, but I've noticed this particular steel mill is right next to a lake, and there's a factory on the other shore. Boats are a bit different to road vehicles or trains, because they don't need their own dedicated tracks, and they can travel on any flat water tile. If you have a big lake or sea, this means you can build a very long distance boat route, without spending much on infrastructure. This already makes boats powerful, but they have another trick. Multiple boats can stack on the same tile. This makes them the only vehicle type in OpenTTD to have infinite capacity. You can add as many boats as you like to a route, and they'll never get jammed or need to queue up for stations. The downside is that boats are slow, and if we need to lower land to sea level or build canals and locks, they get very expensive. To build a boat route, you need to build at minimum a depot and a dock at the origin and destination. I'm going to build these now. A depot near the steel mill. A dock, which I'm going to connect to the existing station to create a station that takes both boats and trains. And then another dock over here at the factory. When I go to build a ship, you'll notice I don't have ships for every type of cargo. Instead, there's this magic bit of text next to the capacity of the Yate cargo ship. Refittable. If I buy one, and then click on this crate icon in the vehicle window, I can choose all sorts of cargoes to carry. For this route, I need steel, so I select that and click to refit the ship. Next, I tell it to load at the steel mill, and unload at the factory. Sometimes ships need a bit of help to navigate around the map. If you keep seeing ship one is lost messages, then you need to place some buoys to help them navigate. These can be selected from the waterways and placed in the water. I then need to tell my ship to use them. To insert an order between two existing ones, simply click the order you want to place your new order above, and there till it's highlighted in white. Then click go to and select the boys. We also need to make sure the ship will use the boys going back in the other direction so it doesn't get lost coming back from the factory. Crossing this lake involves a bit of a detour, so I'm going to build a shortcut using canals. First, I build a canal across this piece of land here. They're on the expensive side, so I need to be careful to keep them short or make sure that I'm going to use them for a busy, profitable route. Now I need to get my ships up to the same level as the canal. Ships are unable to use sloped water tiles. So I'm going to need to build a lock on each slope. This will allow my ships to go up and down to access the canal. To make sure that ships use the canal, sometimes it's useful to place a buoy near each entrance so they can navigate effectively. I need to go back to my ship and change its orders so that instead of using the buoys for the detour, it instead uses the buoys or the locks. Now, you may have noticed some of these pop-ups and some of the newspaper articles claiming new vehicles are available. These prototype vehicles, you can say yes, and if you buy one within the first year of it being available, you will be able to have more prototype vehicles and also use it before anybody else if you're playing multiplayer or against the AI. However, if you say yes 
and then don't use the vehicle, you will be blocked from using prototype vehicles for the next few years. New vehicles come out through the game and can improve stats and give you greater capacity. And later on in the game will give you new types of railways to build, such as monorails and maglevs. There's one last type of transport left in the base game, aircraft. Aircraft are expensive to build and operate, but they can make you a lot of money. The biggest advantage they have is the only infrastructure you need to build is an airport at each destination. It doesn't matter how long distance the route, you only have to pay the cost of building two airports. Because aircraft are fast and good for long distances, this means it's possible to set up a lucrative passenger route without needing to build a complex network. On the downside, aircraft in the base game can only carry a limited set of cargo types, passengers, mail, goods and valuable. To set up an aircraft route, we need to build some airports. There are many types of airports which will be invented as the game progresses. Helicop heliports for helicopters, small airports for little piston engine planes, and large airports and hub airports for jets. Make sure you build the right type of airport. Fixed wing aircraft won't be able to use heliports, and if you send jet aircraft to a small airport, they're likely to crash. If something goes faster than 500 miles per hour or 800 kilometers per hour, make sure you're using a large airport. One peculiarity of airports is they come with the depot built in for all but the smallest heliport. To build planes, we have to click on this hangar here. Planes also use the hangar to service. If they break down, they don't stop in place like the other vehicles, but travel slower and emit a plume of smoke. I guess that saves the mechanics having to get a very long ladder to fix them. To build an air route for passengers, we should look for two large towns. I'm going to build an airport here, in Bodgerton, and an airport up here, in Tutorial Town. As with the bus network, sometimes it's useful to demolish a few roads so that there's a place to put the, the airport. I'm now going to build an aircraft by clicking on the hangar, as mentioned. Because I've built a large airport, I can use this very fast FFP dart. Because the aircraft carries two types of cargo in its default configuration, we want to make sure that it's full of both passengers and mail before flying. To do this, click the arrow next to full load and select this, full load all cargo. I'm going to do this for the other airport down in Potterton and then go back using this pin to go to the aircraft's location. Now if I click start, we will see our aircraft taxi to the terminal, fill up with passengers and mail, then hopefully speed across the map. In just this one trip, it will make a huge amount of money. Aircraft are sometimes frowned upon in multiplayer games because they make so much money without needing any clever or intricate network design, just two airports to be placed. But if you're playing single player and want a quick money injection, Building a long distance air route between two busy towns or flying goods across the map can be very lucrative. So, is that everything you need to know? Of course not! I've been playing this game 27 years and I'm still learning new things, especially all the keyboard shortcuts people like to remind me I've missed. But I like to think I've given you enough to build all the different types of transport and make some money with it. There's lots left to discover. Timetables, transfer orders, downloading add-ons from online content, and all sorts of different gameplay settings such as disabling breakdowns or giving passengers specific destinations. Not to mention endlessly refining and improving your station and junction designs. Remember to test and experiment, and if you get confused at any point, you can always ask questions on the big communities on Reddit or Discord, I'll put links in the description below. I hope you found this tutorial useful and almost as good as the old fashioned way of doing things. If you liked it, please stick around for all the Let's Plays, documentaries and other fun stuff on this channel. But until then, 
Farewell.